And let somebody shout hallelujah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah, the man of war. Please, mercy, endure it. Forever and ever, oh, praise be so holy.
lift our hands to the Almighty. Let's beg, let's begin to bless His holy name. Let's give Him glory. Let's give Him honor. Give Him adoration. Bless the King of Kings. Bless the Lord. Dedicate the church. I think we should settle your own case first. So if you have any special request, go ahead, talk to the Lord about it. Anything you want him to do for you, something that you want to remember this day by, a miracle that only God himself can perform, talk to him now. Now let's begin to bring our prayers to a close. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. We give you honor, amen. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor, amen. We give you all the glory. God, ancient of days, the unchangeable changer, the great builder, the great provider, the great redeemer, the great physician, the great deliverer, our help, our supply, our hope of glory our joy unspeakable. Glory be to your holy name. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for building this temple. Because unless you build it, nobody else could have done it. We thank you. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. First and foremost, Father, we commit all your children who are here this morning to your hands. Whatever may be their needs, meet them today in Jesus' name. No matter how difficult what they have asked for, before the sun sets today, turn it to a testimony. As some people here, Lord God Almighty, it's a long time ago that the new great joy last. Beginning from today, let their joy begin to overflow. Every tree of sorrow in the lives and homes of these your children uproot it today. Every obstruction to their success, every obstruction to their progress, every obstruction to their breakthroughs, let your fire consume. And if there's anyone or any force that says that your children will not reach their goal before this week is over, destroy.
everything that will make the joy of this your children full, Father, release to them today. <laughs> and those who have used one way or the other to build this temple, Father, build them up. Build their families. Build their businesses. Build their joy. Build their faith. And build them themselves. And Father, from today, like never before, let this place become a miracle center. Every sinner who will come here to worship, Father, save their souls. Any sick man who enters here, let him or her walk out completely free. Every prayer prayed here, Father, answer by fire. Father, beginning from today, out of this place, let rivers of healing water flow. From now on, here, let there be a revival. Amen. Let him be well with your children. Amen. And let them serve you to the end. Amen. Even as we dedicate this place to you in the name of the Father, Amen. and of the Son, Amen. and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let someone shout hallelujah. It says, afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The title of the sermon, if I were to preach a sermon, would have been a second divine visitation. You know, I was here not too long ago, and uh, may, please let me congratulate you. This is beautiful. <laughs> this is world class. <laughs> so those of you who participated in the building, you've done something you could be proud of. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Now, the text we read said again, second time in a day, Jesus findeth a certain man in the temple. And then spoke to him and said, well, you'll be made whole. Go sin no more so that you won't get into bigger trouble. You know the story of the man. If you read it from verse 1, there was a man by the pool of Bethesda where an angel comes once in a while, once a year, to stir the pool. And whenever he does that, the first man to jump in was made whole. And then Jesus saw a man there who had been sick for 38 years and went to him and said, will you be made whole? The man said, yes, but I have no help. And Jesus said, all right, let's forget the history. Get up, go home. And he got up and was made whole. So the man then went to the temple of God to go and say, thank you to the Almighty. And then Jesus met him there, second time in a day, and said, oh God, we may do whole on credit, but from now on, sin no more, so you don't get into bigger trouble. A second divine visitation is usually to make your blessings permanent. The man was already blessed, but now Jesus was saying to him, if you want that blessing to be permanent, sin no more. That second visitation was to tell him what to do to prevent a return to certain horrible things that had already happened in the life of the man. It was number one, to tell him what to prevent a return to sickness. 
Exodus 15 verse 26, Exodus 15 verse 26 tells us what to do after we've received our healing so we'll never be sick again. He said, if we will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all he commands you, then you will never be sick again. It is possible to be healthy for the rest of your life. There are people who have asked, how would I die if I don't fall sick? You don't have to be sick to die. You can be healthy to the very last moment, just like I'm going to be. Yeah. I've told you that the day I go, I will come to church. It's going to be a Sunday. I'll come to church on Sunday morning. I will sing, I will dance, have a wonderful time. I will go home, eat a very big bowl of pounded yam, <laughs> and then go away. That is just the way it should be. And uh, while people could die by various means, I have no intention of dying in a road accident. I don't know about you. I don't have, and I have no intention of dying by accidental uh, discharge by the police. I want to live my full life, enjoy myself to the full, praise my God to the very last moment, and then go home. So the Lord told that man what to do. And the reason I know that's the way it's going to be with me is because I know the secret. All I have to do is to hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord my God, observe and do all he commands me. If I do that, he will fulfill his own aspect of the bargain. Number two, the second divine visitation is to tell you what to do so that you don't go back to failure. Because that man had failed several times at the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus told him, if you sin again, then you go back to your life of failure. You will remember that in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, Luke 5, verse 1 to 11, where Jesus came in contact with Peter, who had fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus told him, from now on, you will not be fishing for fish. You'll be fishing for men. But in John 21, verse 1 to 11, John 21, verse 1 to 11, Peter all of a sudden woke up one morning and said, I go fishing. And the result of it was that again he fished and fished and fished and caught nothing. He returned to failure because he didn't listen to God. I'm praying that all of you who are here today, from now, you will listen to God. Yeah. And those of you who are already succeeding, you will never go back to failure. Yeah. And if there's anyone who is still failing here today, you will not fail again. Yeah. Number three, that divine visitation was to tell this man, don't go back to defeat. Because the man said, when Jesus met him for the first time, he said, whenever I'm going into the pool, somebody got there before me. In other words, there were many of us running a race, but each time I got defeated. And so Jesus is saying to him now, let me tell you the secret of never going back into defeat. He told Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, Joshua 1, verse 1 to 8, he said, Joshua, you will never be defeated. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. But by the time we go to Joshua chapter 7, and you can read the whole chapter, you discover that Israel began to run before their enemies. Joshua chapter 7. So Joshua fell on his face and said, God, it's not what you promised me. You promised me I will never be defeated. And the Lord said, well, I will teach you what to do so you will never be defeated again. He said, you are defeated this time because sin had come into the camp. Take sin out of your camp, and then you will never know defeat again. He said, because as long as your core sin is in your camp, then I can't go with you any longer. And so many a times, 
People have said, how come we suffer a defeat after we gave our life to Jesus? After all, we were told, once we give our life to him, nobody will be able to defeat us anymore. The question is, is there an accursed thing in your camp? For example, are you stealing from him? Are you keeping what belongs to God in your home? Are you robbing him of his tithe and of his offering? Are you keeping his first fruit along with your own food? When you put what belongs to God among your own something, it's like it used to happen in the olden days. When the wicked fellow wants to ruin someone, they make a charmed coin. In those days, everybody spent coins. And they give that fellow the coin, they, they probably just dash it. And as long as that evil coin is in the money of the fellow, the money will just keep on decreasing. As long as you put what you should not put in your camp, problem comes. So when the Lord made this man, he said, listen, you will avoid any further defeat if you sin no more. Number four, he is saying, please stop sinning so that you don't go back to stagnation. Because that man was sick for 38 years. He was stagnant for 38 years. And the reason he was stagnant for 38 years was because he kept on missing opportunities. The angel kept coming every year without fail. But this man kept on missing those opportunities, so he remained stagnant. And so the Lord was telling him, this is what to do, so you don't go back to stagnation. Stop sinning, so you won't have to go back to stagnation again. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, we see the story of Jericho. Jericho had Elijah walking up and down among them all the time. And they kept quiet with their problems. They knew that there was problem in the land. They knew everything may look beautiful on the surface, but deep down there was death, there was barrenness, and they did nothing about it. But when they saw Elijah go to heaven, and they saw his mantle fall on Elisha, and Elisha now came, because Elisha was there before, following Elijah out. When he came on the second visitation, they grabbed the opportunity. I believe in God for someone here today. Whatever opportunity you missed when we came last time, you will grab it today in Jesus' name. <laughs> and so the Lord was telling this man, number five, say no more so you don't go back into bondage. Because that man was in bondage. He could not leave the spot where he was for 38 years. Why? Because you never can tell when the angel will come back. So he stayed around the pool for 38 years as a man who is bound, a man who could not move forward or backward, just in one spot. The only time he ever moved was in making an attempt to get into the pool, he will fail, and then he will return back to the uh, square one. So it's like somebody going around in circles. But when the Lord met him the first time, he broke that yoke. But he now told him, if you sin again, you will go back into bondage. In Exodus 14, verse 21 to 28, Exodus 14, verse 21 to 28, you will notice that the first time that Moses lifted his hand against the Red Sea, the Red Sea parted, and the children of Israel were able to walk through into freedom. Then he raised his hand the second time, and the second time the sea closed up behind them. Now, many a times, all we saw in the sea coming together was in the drowning of the Egyptians. But it was more than that. The closing of the Red Sea after the children of Israel was to make it impossible for them to go back to Egypt. Because God knew them very well that sooner or later they will say, we want to go back. And you know, there are more than one occasions when they say, there, this Moses is dead. 
We don't know what became of him. Let's make another captain and go right back to Egypt. They didn't know that, of course, then they will have to deal with the Red Sea on their way back. And without Moses, the Red Sea is not going to part for anyone. As a matter of fact, the Red Sea had never parted since then. Now, I believe in God for someone here today, particularly those of you already free. You will not be bound again. Yeah. And uh, number six, I told you I'm giving you an outline, but looks as if the outline is becoming a sermon. Uh, number six, the Lord was telling this man, don't go back into sin so you don't go back to sorrow. Because the man was a sad man before. Anyone will be if you have been sick for 38 years. If you have been a failure for 38 years, stagnant for 38 years, defeated for 38 years, in bondage for 38 years, you cannot be a happy man. But the first time the Lord came across this man, he said to the problem of his sorrow. Now he now said to him the second time, this is what you do so you don't go back to sorrow. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 17, 2 Kings 4, verse 8 to 17, the Shunammite woman was sad because in spite of the fact that she was wealthy and had a, a lot of influence, she was sad because the only thing that would have made her joyful was denied her, and that was that she was barren. But the first time that Elisha spoke to her, that problem was solved because she became pregnant and had a son. But then the son grew up and then died. And the woman said, I will not return to sorrow. And I believe there are one or two people here today who are determined by the special grace of God, I am not going back to sorrow. If you are one of them, let me hear you say amen. amen. That's why the woman said to Elisha, I'm not leaving you. You brought joy into my life. You have to come and restore that joy. That's the why the woman said, it doesn't matter, sir. I'm going, I'm holding on to you until you return. That woman, in desperate faith, said to Satan, the one that has made my joy full is the one you have swallowed. You have to vomit it. And uh, the Almighty God told Elisha, you go back with this woman, give her a second visitation, and see to it that her joy will now last forever. I believe that God more or less compelled me to come this morning to say to someone, beginning from now, you will never know sorrow again. <laughs> but finally, number seven, the Almighty God was telling this man, say no more so that you don't go back to the wrong crowd. Because this man was among a multitude, a multitude of sick, blind, wildered, lame, that's how the Bible des describes them, a horrible congregation. And it says, if you sin again, you will go and join them one more time. Now, the Bible tells us that according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, when we were living in sin, we were as people who were dead. He said we were dead in trespasses and sin. So in those days when we, we thought we were enjoying drinking our beer, fornicating, lying, cheating, and boasting about it to our friends, oh, last week was bad. Oh, last night was horrible. And what they meant was that they, they got drunk woke up the following morning, their head was aching, and they, they thought they were enjoying life, but they were a congregation of dead people, dead do living. But then the, Jesus came, saved our soul, and now the Bible says in Proverbs chapter uh, 21, verse 16, Proverbs 21, verse 16, 
He said, if you wander from the way of righteousness, then you will now dwell in the congregation of the dead. In other words, if you backslide, after you gave your life to Jesus Christ, this time you will be in the congregation of the dead permanently. It is my prayer for all of us who are already born again, who are already in the Lord, who are already serving him, that nothing will take us back into the world of sin in Jesus' name. Amen. Which brings me to the conclusion. And the conclusion is simple. Its conclusion is found in the story of a man called Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Like this man, for 40 years of his life, he was sick. For 40 years of his life, he was stagnant. They would always take him to one spot, put him there. The sun would beat him, the rain would beat him. For 40 years of his life, he was a sad man. For 40 years of his life, he had known what it is to be a failure. Because from that story, you can be sure it wasn't every day he begged that he got anybody to pity him. Because the day he was crying to Jesus for help, the people were shouting him down. That shows you that those people are not very generous people. But then that man had a divine visitation. And in a single moment, all his problems were over. Now what is it that Bartimaeus did? Bartimaeus made up his mind. I'm not even going to wait for a second visitation. I will make this visitation permanent. The Bible said he followed Jesus in the way. My advice to those of us who are already children of the living God, who had had divine visitations in the past, he had healed us, he had set us free, he had started prospering us, he had put an end to our failure, he had turned our defeat to victory. My advice to us is hold on to him and serve him to the end. Several years ago, when people asked me, uh, when people say, oh, don't worry, it's uh, hot now. One day it will cool down. That's the way everybody started, always trying to reach heavens. But after some time, they will slow down. I told them the reason I could not possibly slow down. I know where I'm coming from. I know what I was suffering before I met the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, I'm not going back into that. So I don't know about you, but if you have suffered in the past, and now the Almighty God had picked you up out of the dunghill and is already promoting you, I'm sure you make up your mind, I too will never go back. Now, as for those of you who have never had a real encounter with Jesus Christ, let this be your day. Let this be the moment that you have been waiting for. Let this be the opportunity that you will never miss. So if you are here and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, I will encourage you that you come forward now and come and surrender your life to Jesus. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe you have enough room here. Okay, if you want to come from upstairs, from all the galleries, from downstairs, if you want to come, you come very quickly. I bet I don't have much time. So if you want to come, you have to hurry up because I will be leaving in the next one minute. So if you are not here within one minute, then you have missed this opportunity again. But I will count from one to seven to give you enough time to step forward. And I'm counting now one. Two, three, four. 
I know some of you might be coming from afar, but you have to hurry up because I have to go. Five. I hope all doors are open so that you can come. Hurry up. Don't miss this your own opportunity. This is your own day. And you have to hurry up and come very quickly. Okay. I wait 30 seconds more. I can see you coming from that direction. Okay. Those of you who are clapping, if you want to clap, clap. Anyone else, if you want to, come quickly. Six. All right. Now, if you are still on the way, just keep coming. Make sure you get there before I finish praying. And please don't, don't hinder them. Let them come quickly. All right. Now those of you already in front, you talk to the Lord. Just ask him to be merciful unto you. Ask him to save your soul. Ask him to be merciful unto you. Ask him to save your soul. Promise him that from now on you will serve him. That you will do his will from this moment on. And the rest of us, will you please stretch your hands towards these people and pray for them. Ask that the almighty God who saved your soul will save their own souls also. That God will forgive all their sins and give them a brand new beginning. Please pray for them for just one minute. And if anyone else is still on the way, please hurry up because I'm about to pray for salvation now. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Savior, I want to bless your holy name. I want to thank you for your word and I want to thank you for these your children who have surrendered their lives to you. Every one of them, Lord, please receive them in Jesus' name. Forgive them in Jesus' name. Wash them clean with your blood in Jesus' name. And even as you are saving their souls today, please write their names in the book of life and let them serve you till the end. Please don't let them go back into the world of sin and let them do your will all the days of their lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I want to rejoice with those of you who have come forward. I want to promise you that from now on, by the grace of God, I'll be praying for you. Very soon, the counselors will take you away. They will collect your names, your address, and your prayer request so that they will Give me the information, I will begin to pray for you. Congratulations. Uh, but before you go, I want you to be part of the prayer we're about to pray. Now the rest of us, we're going to pray a prayer. It's simple. You already know what to do. And if you will stay away from sin, live a life of holiness, then all your problems that God had already solved for you will never reoccur. That's why I asked you to pray first before we even preached. So you're going to lift your voice to the Almighty God loud and clear and say, Father. Father. And loud and clear, Father. Father. By your grace, by your grace I, will I will stay away from sin. Let my blessings be permanent. Let my blessings be permanent. Go ahead, talk to the Almighty God.
There is a redeemed Christian Church of God very close to you. Join them for a life-changing experience in worship. The Word of God enjoins us to study to show ourselves approved of the Lord. If you are one of the people who desire to indeed be approved of God in all your ways, and you desire to understand God's ways, then you need to take Christian literature serious. There is a large collection of inspirational books from Pastor E. A. Adeboye, the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, that you can pick and read from. Among the numerous titles are David, A Man After God's Heart, The Last Days, The Ultimate Financial Breakthrough, Divine Encounter, and many more. And just recently added are Time of Favor and The Sovereign Lord. Get yourself a copy. Get extra copies to bless the lives of people around you as well. The books are available at all CRM bookshops, all Christian bookshops, and bookstands in all RCCG province headquarters worldwide. Get yourself a copy of any of the books and be richly blessed. You're watching Redeemers Network Television.